about PGAS is an experiment that you get to conduct yourself to learn new things in science. It's an opportunity for junior high students to conduct a scientific experiment. It's a lot of work. It's definitely good to get involved in if you, if you like science. You have to make up by yourself and learn to present it in front of a group. You learn more about uh, a certain topic. It's just being involved in it and going to the competition, competing against the other kids, it's, it's great. Penn State is a sense of accomplishment, a lot of fun. The judging gets a lot harder when you get a first place at regionals and you get to move on to a state competition. You get to be with your friends, but you also get to learn more when you're competing against 11 other regions. Because you're in a room with all people that also got first place, so you learn more about their projects and you also get to present your own. introduction. Good morning judges and fellow participants. My name is Mary Kay Dara and I am in the 8th grade at St. Joseph the Worker School. The topic I have chosen for my Junior Academy project is, does intensity and area of illumination vary between compact fluorescent and incandescent light bulbs? I chose this topic because light bulbs are a necessity in our modern lives and I was curious to see if my choice of light bulb would affect the way a room is lit. Also, there has been a trend to replace incandescent with compact fluorescent light bulbs, and I wanted to see which is truly the best. The following is an example of a background. The simplest form of visible light is light of a single, definite color or frequency. White light is a more complex form of light, being colorless to the human eye, and composed of many different light frequencies. There are several theories regarding the composition of light. The first describes light as comprised of tiny, microscopic blue lights or stimulants to the growth of flowers. And although flowers are vital in plant reproduction, a supply of well-functioning chlorophylls, as well as a larger surface area for them to be distributed over, is more key to the growth of a healthy plant. of the body of the project, containing the hypothesis, the procedure, and your results. Hypothesis. I hypothesize that a homemade calorimeter can accurately measure the amount of calories in a certain food within a 10% range. I believe this because a homemade calorimeter is very similar, yet less complex than a real calorimeter. Therefore, it should work close to the efficiency of a scientific calorimeter. Procedure. The procedure I followed was step one, gather materials. Coffee can, soda can, drill, water, cork, wire, needle, a small torch, peanuts, which were my control, shredded wheat cereal, unfrosted, pepperoni, caramel popcorn, safety goggles, flame-resistant gloves, a thermometer, paper and pencil, aluminum foil, a scale, and a marble so Excuse me. C. Drill 14 holes evenly spaced around the bottom of the coffee can. D. Take the wire and pull it through the top holes of the soda can so that the soda can is suspended on top of the coffee can. E. Wrap the cork in aluminum, find the mass of the burned peanut, and record results. Step 10. Repeat steps 3 through 9 two times for accuracy. Step 11. Repeat steps 3 through 10 for all other foods. This graph, the, excuse me, these are my results. This graph shows trials 1, 2, and 3, my calorimeter calories versus my label calories. My x-axis shows the foods, and my y-axis shows my results in calories per gram. My key indicates that blue represents trial 1, green represents trial 2, yellow represents trial 3, and orange represents the label. As you can see from my results, in all three trials of the shredded wheat, marshmallow, pepperoni, and caramel popcorn, 
my calorimeter calories were calculated lower than the label calories. In trials 2 and 3 of the peanut, however, my calorimeter calories were calculated higher than my label calories. This graph shows my trial 1% differences. My x-axis remains the same. My y-axis shows my results in percentages. As you can see from my results, none of the foods reached my goal within the 10% range. The food that was closest to my goal was the caramel popcorn, having a 25.4 percentage. The food that was furthest from my goal was the marshmallow, having a 76.4 percentage. This graph shows my trial 2% differences. My x and y axes remain the same. As you can see from my results, only one of the foods, the peanut, reached my goal within the 10% range. The peanut had a negative 9.7 percentage. The food that was second closest to my goal was the caramel popcorn, having a 13.5 percentage. The food that was furthest from my goal once again was the marshmallow, having a 74.4 percentage. This graph shows my trial 3% differences. My x and y axes remain the same. As you can see from my results, once again, none of the foods reached my goal within the 10% range. The food that was closest to my goal was the peanut, having a, 21, having a negative 21.7 percentage. The food that was furthest from my goal was the pepperoni, having a 63.8 percentage. This concludes the body of the project. I am now going to present the closing of the project. Conclusion I reject my hypothesis that the gussets would be the best reinforcement on a chest bridge. I reject my hypothesis because the bridges with the more lattices on the roadbed held more weight, which was an average of 64.26 kilograms, than the bridge with the gussets, which held an average of 61.09 kilograms. I can further my experiment by finding the efficiency of my bridges. I have done so, and these are my results. This graph shows the bridge efficiency of all my bridges. The x-axis shows the reinforcement, the y-axis shows the efficiency, and the key indicates that the red represents gussets, Blue represents lattices on roadbed, orange represents vertical structures, purple represents more sticks on the main supports, and green represents my control, which had no reinforcements. As you can see, the vertical structures were the most efficient, having an efficiency of 494.75. This is followed by the lattices on the roadbed, the gussets, my control, and the least efficient, which was the more sticks on the main support, which which was an efficiency of 279.87. My project is practical for bridge builders. This project can help them choose which kind of reinforcement they should use to make a bridge stronger. Even though modern bridges are made of steel, the concept used in my reinforcements can be used in steel bridges too. Thank you for your time and attention. Are there any questions?
I'm now going to do the closing of the project. I reject my hypothesis that the gussets would be the best reinforcement on the chest ridge. I reach. This is a blooper. Dude, watch. Now. <laughs> <laughs>